This morning we have made it to week three in our series on common unity. We started the series by answering the question, how do I join the community? We began by looking in Acts chapter 2, and this was the first community, the start of it all. And we kind of said, you know what, let's go back to the beginning and let's see how it happened. And how did they become a part of a community of believers? And it really, it's kind of simple. And I hope that we at Eastwood Baptist Church would leave it this simple as well. It says to be a part of the community, you repent of your sins, you turn to Jesus, you are filled with the Holy Spirit, and you demonstrate that by getting baptized. Now, we do have another little step in there that we like to add, and it's just a simple class, a membership information class, um, that we ask you to come and be a part of in order to join our church, just to simply really get to know who we are, and we want to get to know you as well. And that membership information class is coming up in a few weeks. Uh, We'd love for you to be a part of that if you are interested in uh, joining our church, getting to know more about us, and we have baptism coming up again in a few weeks and we've baptized 14 people in the last four weeks and uh, we want to see you be a part of that uh, as well so if you want to get baptized and you're ready to talk to one of our staff members about that at our connection uh, desk as you go out the atrium to your left there's a place for you to sign up to be a part of baptism a place for you to sign up to be a part of our information class last week we though we started and uh, this week and last week is What happens when the Holy Spirit comes on us and we come and we're a part of the community? If you have your outline with you and you want to follow along, I want you to write this down. It says, when the Holy Spirit comes on us, we live in harmony so that we can be sympathetic, we can love as brothers, we can be compassionate and humble. Last week, we we kind of dove into each of those words and, and what they mean to be a part of a community. And the only way that we can really live in harmony is when we all bring the Holy Spirit with us. Because the Holy Spirit is what leads us to be those things. We kind of focus on the word humble. And I hope maybe you remember that from the images I brought last week. For us to be humble, we need to come to church wearing an apron, not a bib. And that's simply what that word means, to be a servant. You know, I appreciate Mark Mize stepping up and reading God's word this morning. You know, Mark has been coming every Sunday for over a year now and making coffee in our coffee shop. You know, then he goes and he leads a family life group. Then he goes and comes in as a part of the choir. You know, I could say that for a hundred people in this room. Because you wear an apron every Sunday morning, Eastwood Baptist Church is who she is today because of servants like so many of you. You know, my wife and I are are very different in the kinds of aprons that we wear. You know, I get energized, and I know this is kind of weird, I get energized when I come and set up chairs, when I come and put out drinks, um, when I come and serve in those kinds of ways. She gets energized when she gets to come and actually meet and greet and talk. You know, we're both wearing an apron, but those aprons are very different. What our hope is, is that everyone in here finds your apron that you come and you serve and you wear so that you can remove the bib. You know, the Bible describes us as babies in Christ when we come to know Jesus. So there is a period that everybody is wearing a bib But for some of you, bib's been on way too long. It's time to take the bib off, put the apron on, and all of us begin to serve together. Hey, if you looked at uh, our scripture for today out of 1 Peter, the main verse is verse 4, chapter 4, verse 8, excuse me, where Peter says, above all, love each other deeply. We're going to focus on that passage, but in order for us to do that, we need to take a magnifying glass And we need to really look at this scripture. We need to look at the verses before it, and we need to look at the verses behind it. What does it really mean to love each other deeply? If you look at verse 7, what's happening right before the above all? So he gets to that word. We know if he says above all, 
That's something real important we need to look at. But if you look right above it, he says, the end of all things is near. You know, it really doesn't matter when Jesus is going to come back. Like, we don't know those days. But what we really need to know is the end of all things for any one of us could happen at any moment. The end of all things is near. That's why we have to live life with the proper perspective. Always keep heaven in view. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour that Jesus will come back, and we don't know the day, we don't know the hour that any one of us can pass from this life to the next. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 9, verse 4, he says, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And, and James goes on to say it in James 4, 14, why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while, then vanishes. So when we look at this passage of Scripture, we got to start with that in mind. The end of all things is near. Every single one of us should live today like today could be our last day. So what should we do? He says in the next verse, be clear-minded and self-control. And what he's saying here is preserve your sanity. Because that can be really overwhelming to think about, right? If you actually got up every day and thought, this is my last day, I mean, that, that can be a little overwhelming. That can lead someone to some insane kind of thinking. I want you to write this down. It's on your outline. When he's talking about be clear-minded and self-control, he's wanting us to kind of meet in the middle. It's insane to build an underground bunker and not face the world. So it would be insane to think, oh no, this is my last day. I'm going to go underground. I'm going to be safe. I'm going to have protection. I'm going to escape the things of this world. But on the opposite end, it's also insane to live so carefree, you act like this is your final destination. Basically with the thought that I've got to get it all in now. I've got, to, I've got to get the bucket list completely finished. Reminds me of the old song. Been skydiving, Rocky Mountain climbing, 2.7 seconds on some bull named Fu Manchu. You know, that's how some of us live. And, and the song is saying, live like you're dying. And that's the extreme. But also the extreme is to hide, to escape. And even some ways to fill our life so much of church that we're escaping the things of this world on the outside. He says, be clear-minded and self-controlled. And then he tells us why. So you can pray. I want you to think about this for a minute in your life. Whenever you've been on the extremes of that, the extremes of bunkering yourself down, and the extremes of living life to the full and getting everything you've ever wanted, dreamed of. When you live on those extremes, your prayer life was probably at its weakest place. Because unless we're, clear, we're being clear-minded and self-control, our prayer life will not be where it needs to be. William Barclay states it this way. When a man's mind is unbalanced and his approach to life is frivolous, and irresponsible, he cannot pray as he ought. So to set this whole perspective up, he says the end is near, keep your sanity, and pray. That's a pretty good three-part sermon, right? That's some pretty good advice. But he's just getting started. Because now he's going into the above all. If the end is near, you need, to, oh, you need to keep your sanity. You need to pray. But what else do you need to do? He says, above all. Look at this. If it's your last day on earth, and for some of us it might be, we don't know. This is what you're to do. He says, this is the best advice I can give you. He says, above all. And what does he say? Love 
each other deeply. Above all, if it's all you got left, love each other deeply. The word that he uses here is not an emotional word. It's a constant. It's an it's a intense and energetic kind of love. I know a lot of times we think of falling in and falling out of love. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about a love for the community, a love for believers. He describes it this way in the Greek. That this word is a dig deep kind of love. You know, you know, you tell someone like a runner or someone in sports, and they're getting to the fourth quarter, they're getting to the very end, and you're telling them, dig deep, give everything you have left. The word picture that's given here is of a runner or a horse in a race, and they're coming down the final stretch, and they're giving it all they have. They're digging deep inside of them to give the very best. That can be given. That's the kind of love that he says we should give. If the end of all things is near, love each other deeply. Not emotional. Not falling in and falling out. Love deeply. For some of us, this may, this is the place where church hopping stop, stops. When we begin to be a part of a community that we say, I'm going to love deeply deeply the body of Christ the community of this church and it's going to be a constant intense and energetic kind of love it goes on to say that this kind of love covers a multitude of sins Woo. he's not talking about forgiveness here because we can't do that he's not saying that our love brings you forgiveness of sins no he's saying this He's saying that when you love deeply like this, you will overlook the failures in people. That's what he's saying. Even though the people around you, they fail you, we'll love them anyway. Give love all you can give, and not just to those who love you. Love the unlovable, love the unforgivable, love those who have hurt you and insulted you, and that's just those of us in church today. Love the community of believers. Turn on community by loving deeply. Let me summarize it. There's no time just to think about saving yourself and living selfish. You will be happiest when you choose to go out of, get out of your apron and love each other deeply like this. He goes on to give us three practical ways to love deeply. On the back of your outline, if you're following along. Practical ways. This is where we get down to some specifics. We've all kind of just now, we've talked about loving deeply. Just kind of as this thought. But now let's see, what does he exactly mean? He says in verse 9, to offer hospitality to one another... And then it's interesting that he adds this little ending to it. Without grumbling. <laughs> as if he knew what was going to happen. As if he knew our minds, he knew our hearts, he knew exactly where we would go with this. He adds that little bit to the end. Look, uh, he says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. In this context, he's saying, look, you got a lot of people who are traveling missionaries, ministers, a lot of strangers who are coming and being a part of what you got going on in your community. He says, show them hospitality, open your homes to them, because they didn't have a church building. So he's saying, invite them in, feed them, take care of them, even if they're strangers. So how do we love on strangers? You know, we didn't welcome any strangers to Eastwood Baptist Church this morning. We welcome guests. Because that's how we feel that you are when you come into this place. You're our guest. So how do we show hospitality to our guests at Eastwood Baptist Church? We've got to be on guest alert. Now, 
If you're a guest in here today, you probably just wanted to kind of slide underneath your chair. Of all Sundays you can be here, he's talking about the day that we should be on guest alert. All right, we're not going to overwhelm you with that, I assure you. But that's exactly what showing hospitality means in our context, in our setting today. You know, we have parking lot attenders, we have greeters, we have a welcome team. Every Sunday, they show up with their apron on, and they are serving in those areas, and they are on guest alert. But I want you to understand this. Very seldom, very seldom, do people come and say, man, I was shown so much hospitality by your parking lot attenders, your greeters, and your welcome desk. Because you know what? That's where they expect to be shown hospitality. Where they say Eastwood Baptist Church blew me away is when the everyday ordinary member of this church is wearing an apron and is being on guest alert and is greeting and meeting and showing hospitality to those people. Why does he say do it without grumbling? I think, here, I got a couple of ideas. You know, very seldom do people complain who show hospitality to strangers. The people who complain are those who are watching others show hospitality to strangers and they're wishing they were getting it themselves. That's usually where we get the complaints. We're not doing enough for our own people. Why are we showing so much to outsiders? The other way we do get some complaints is those who, who every week are showing hospitality and every week they're on guest alert and every week they're in areas of service and they finally come and say, I'm burned out. I've got to slow down a little bit. That's why when only a few people in a community are showing hospitality, they will be complain when they feel burned out. Let's all do the work of hospitality so some don't get burned out and all feel welcomed. The second thing he tells to do, practical ways of loving deeply, he says to serve others. In verse 10 it says, each one, everybody say that's me. Somebody didn't say it. Everybody say, that's me. me. There we go. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. We talked about this a few weeks ago. What do you bring? You bring the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit give you? The Holy Spirit gives you gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit. There are several places in Scripture that list the the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4. I I think there's a slide of it. If you go ahead and pull that up, I'm going to show you the listing of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that when we come with our aprons on, we serve others by using these gifts. Now, when we look at this, one of the tendencies to look at a list like this and go through Scripture and looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit, is we look at these like a menu. And we go on here and we begin to want to pick out items on that menu that we kind of think, you know what, that fits my personality. You know what, That, that kind of fits my areas of expertise at my job. I want you to take a look at this list again this time I want you to look at it like this is a buffet line this isn't a menu to pick and choose this is a buffet line that you get to go down and you get to experience each and every one of these I'll tell you a quick little story oh Mackenzie doesn't mind when she was little I don't know, Mackenzie, how old you were, probably before she was six, seven years old. She came up to us one day and she said, all my life, it's my dream to go eat at the Golden Restaurant. And we were like, what? The Golden Restaurant? 
We were kind of confused. She said, yeah, the restaurant, it's on TV, and it has the fountain flowing with chocolate. She was a little dramatic back then. She's not anymore. So one day, it just happened, we were going to, Miss Ann, uh, Leanne's mom is here this morning. Uh, it just happened that we were going to meet them in Mississippi and uh, pick up the girls, drop off the girls. It was one of those exchanges. And they have a golden corral in Macomb, Mississippi. Is that right, Miss Ann? I think it was Macomb, Mississippi. And Mackenzie got word that we were going to the Golden Corral. She was beside herself all her life. <laughs> this was her dream. She saw it on a commercial. And we wonder why people pay big bucks for commercials. She gets there, and she goes to eat. And, of course, the only thing she really wants off the, off the buffet is the chocolate and the desserts. And she ate every bit of it. it tried every dessert, put chocolate on everything, that she could get her hands on. I don't really remember if it made her sick, but she hasn't really asked to go back to the Golden Corral since then. <laughs> I want you to think about this, though. When it comes to using your gifts, some of you go straight for what you think you would be good at doing. You go straight for the chocolate. And what ends up happening is it might even make you a little sick. It might have been a bad experience. It may not have turned out the way that you thought or dreamed all your life it would turn out. I want you to understand spiritual gifts and serving others in this way. God does not work according to our conventional wisdom and is not limited to our personalities when it comes to serving Him. Consider what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 28. He says, brothers, I think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Now get this. He says, what you may see on that list would be foolish to you. That may be exactly what God is choosing for you to do. He says, what you think is lowly on that list, that might be your spiritual gift. What you think is your weakest area, he's saying, that may be the area I choose to give you a gift. Why? Look at this. It gets to the very end of this verse. So that no one may boast before him. When it comes, it's on your outline, when it comes to spiritual gifts, God enjoys creating from nothing. Isn't that his pattern? Isn't that his pattern throughout scripture? That's what he did in creation, right? Yes, he created from nothing. You have gifts that line up with your personality profile tests. They do. And if you've taken one of those personality profile tests, I hope you will not limit yourself to what came out on that personality profile test. Because God's got so much more. You see, I think there's advanced gifts that God wants to give you. And some of you haven't gone and really found out what your advanced gifts are yet because the advanced gifts come from nothing to God saying, I'm going to give this to you. See, God can do more in your life and can, when you are continually serving in fresh ways. Think about it. You were born again for a reason. Born again so God can start fresh with you. I want to tell you about a lady in our church. I think Miss Jane. Where you at, Miss Jane Burns? There she is. Miss Jane Burns. Around 2014, Miss Jane was asked to lead a Bible study at Heritage Village. She had never done anything like this before. She was a school teacher. What you taught little kids, huh, Miss Jane? She talked to little ones. 2014, she was asked to go lead a Bible study at Heritage Village. You know, she took a chance. She said yes. 
And now most of you probably haven't been able to witness Miss Jane. But if you're able to go witness her leading a Bible study at Savannah Grand or Savannah Cottage, you will see that lady has an amazing gift. She didn't figure that out until later in life. But you know what? She said, I'll take a chance. I'll go serve. And through that, she's able to see God take from nothing and do something amazing in her and the people she's able to serve. Write this down. Christians who are empowered by the Holy Spirit will not be hesitant to try them all. But that's the key, being empowered by the Holy Spirit. When we get into the habit of neglecting the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, we will begin to say things like, that's not my personality. I'm not gifted that way. I don't have the gift of mercy. I don't have the gift of teaching. I'm telling you what, every single one of those is not from the Holy Spirit. When we say, I don't and I can't, the Holy Spirit says, I will. And when you begin to not neglect the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you will begin to say, I will, more and more and more to areas of serving that you never said before. It comes from the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Don't stop trying. I like most all foods. I do. But if there's something that I don't like, which is very rare, I do something really weird. I keep eating until I like it. Anybody else like that? Am I the only one? Listen, I couldn't stand olives when I was growing up. I love olives now. Why? Because every chance I had, I popped one in. Ooh. And eventually, I liked it. Did the same thing with collard greens. Eventually, I, hey, you, you give me a buffet line with some collard green and cornbread, that's what I'm going for. Why am I saying that? Because that's the same way with spiritual gifts. Keep trying them. Keep showing God. God, I just want to serve you. I want to serve you in fresh ways. I want to serve you in new ways. And I'm going to tell you, some of those things, after you keep doing it over and over and over again, you're going to realize this is what God has called me to do. This is what he has for me. Stay hungry for more gifts. And the final one, I'm going to go through this one real fast. He says, give your best. It says in verse, first part of verse 11, if anyone should speak... He should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. You know, I want you to be yourself, but I want you to gain some motivation from others. For example, if you teach, Tony Evans it. If you sing, Carrie Underwood it. If you manage money, Dave Ramsey it. If you cook, Martha Stewart it. If you clean, make it spotless, Mr. Clean it. If you decorate, Joanna gains it. If you encourage or motivate, some of you may not get this one, Chris Farley it. If you compete, Tim Tebow it. When you love deeply, love like Jesus. Love like Jesus. You don't bring your leftovers when you are invited to a party. Don't come to the community with your leftovers. Bring your A game. And here's the result. God will be praised. It says in the last part of verse 11, So that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. You may not get applauded. You may not get recognized. You may not get appreciated the way you thought. But when you choose to turn on community by getting in harmony and loving each other deeply, God will get the praise. Isn't that what you really want anyway? Let's pray together. We're going to have a time of invitation and Brian's going to come and lead us. We're going to have some church leaders who will be down front. At the end of this time of prayer, 
If you want to come join our church, come see one of them. If you want to repent of your sins and get saved, come see one of them. If you're ready to get baptized, come and talk to one of them. If you just want somebody to pray for you, come and see them as well. Father, as we enter this time of invitation, it is our prayer that our lives will bring you praise. Not just on Sunday morning and not just when we turn K-Love on, but God, by the way we serve you, by the way we let you have complete control, we, we turn our lives into you as a blank piece of paper and we say, God, take me, use me. I'm your servant. Put my apron on. God, may, may I not be confined to what I think my personality is. May I not be confined to, to my experiences in the past. But God, I want to serve you in new and fresh ways. I pray for some today, Lord, that they haven't repented of their sins. I pray this morning they'll come talk to one of our church leaders. And get that right, because we do not know what tomorrow will bring. The end of all things is near pray some in this room will not delay they'll get saved this morning pray you'll lead others lord to get baptized they haven't demonstrated that publicly yet and god if there's some in this room today that want to join our church i pray this morning the holy spirit will just encourage them to be a part of this community god this is your time we offer this invitation to you may we respond according to the way you'd have us do that in jesus name Amen.